My Gavanen, welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and it is a new year, and I've got, well, you may have noticed I'm wearing a new shirt, which I got for Christmas. I've got another new shirt for Christmas as well, which will pop up in future videos. And also, you might have noticed over my shoulder, and this shoulder, that's another Christmas present. It's a lamp that's basically a 3D printed model of Rivendell, which is really cool. Uh, there's some other stuff that'll be popping up in the future as well. There's also a painting of Rivendell that's going to end up on <clears throat> the wall over here. And, yeah, it's it was kind of a very Tolkien-y Christmas. But now that I'm recovered from the disease that struck me down in December and had some time to recover and actually get myself together, it's time to get back to making videos. And... I have a lot of videos that were suggested that were related to Turin in one way or another. And so this is one of the first that I'm going to be doing. Well, the first of probably about three that have been sub suggested, but the other two are going to take a little more research. And this one is about two fan films. One of them called Neonor Niniel, which you can find on YouTube, and which is not so much a standard movie, but it's really kind of like a... A, a song that is about Turin's story, but which is, it's just a song. Like, there's no um, dialogue, there's no narration. I mean, the song itself has narration in it, but there's no dialogue or anything like that. But the stuff that's in the song is acted out in the video. And it's interesting. The second is The Legend of Gurthang, or Gurthang, really, technically, but they call it Gurthang in the video. And you can find it on the website of the person who created it. I don't think it's actually on YouTube, uh, probably because the guy didn't want to run into copyright problems. But uh, it's connected to Turin's story, but it's not actually about Turin. So it's a little bit different. So... I'm going to talk about both of these, what I like, what I don't like, and so that'll be my, this will be my first video for the new year, and hope you enjoy. So first, let's take a look at the Neonor Niniel film, which is pretty short, actually both of them are very short, and like I said about this one, it's really just a song with the action acted out in the in the video. There's no actual dialogue, but we see what's going on. And anyone familiar with the Turin Turambar story will recognize what's going on. Although, there's a short period close to the beginning where it gets a little confusing. And this is one of the things that I kind of don't like about it, because it skips a huge amount of Turin's story. Like, we see Turin leaving Morwen in the care of a couple guys, and of course that's normal. But it, it kind of skips part of his earlier life, which is, that's not that big of a deal. But after we see him leave, we then see him talking to a woman after he's grown up. And at first I'm thinking, is this Nellis and Doriath? And then immediately we get a scene from Nargothrond where the captives are being taken away and, you know, and he's running after following them, which is... A, a little bit wrong, because he doesn't follow them immediately. He goes and looks for his mother <laughs> first. Uh, but, so, I mean, they skip basically all of Turin's life between when he leaves his mother and when Nargothrond is sacked. And it, get, it makes it a little bit confusing if you have expectations going into the story. After that, though, it pretty well sticks to the material, although it shortens everything down a ton for obvious reasons. But the whole time, this song is playing in the background, and the song itself is actually quite haunting and kind of beautiful. The only thing I don't like about it is the fact that the only musical accompaniment is a piano, which is playing just a very simple tune with like a, a bass line and a, a treble line. And like, it's, there's nothing wrong with the tune, it's just really simple, and it'd be nice if it was a tad bit more complex and maybe had one or two more instruments, I think. But like I say, the singing itself is fine. The only tricky part about the singing is, whoever's doing the singing, it's not somebody who is a native English speaker, it doesn't sound like. There's a fairly heavy accent, and so it's hard 
for me to understand the words, which is kind of a shame because like I could catch some of them and the ones I can catch, you know, it tells you that it's following along with the story, but it's kind of in a poetic form, right? It's not just narrating. It's, it's being more of a, as you would expect, more poetic than if it was just a simple narration. And I wish I could understand the words a little bit better because I feel like it would probably actually be a pretty good poem slash song about the story and maybe even kind of in the vein of, you know, the, the, the huge long epic poem that Tolkien actually wrote about Turin, although it's probably not in the Anglo-Saxon alliterative meter, <laughs> at least as far as I can tell from what I'm hearing. But the song itself, like I said, is actually very haunting and, and kind of beautiful. Uh, but anyway, we see most of the story, other than skipping that huge part of Turin's you know, life, and there's a scene where we get to see Glaurung uh, take Neonor's memory away, although we kind of just barely see a mouth of the dragon. I mean, it's clearly a low-budget thing, and they didn't have a budget for a huge dragon or one that looked very good. And the mouth of the dragon, you can tell, is not the best high-quality thing either, but, I mean, it's they're doing what they can, and it's it's okay. Now, one thing I should mention here is, after this happens, we do see Neonor run away from the elves when they're attacked by orcs after she's lost her memory. And in this film, she does what she does in the story, which is take off all of her clothes. Uh, now, it does it in kind of a tasteful way so that you never see anything full frontal, which, to me, if you're going to make an actual movie of the Turin to Rumbar story, that's how you should do it. Like... I don't think you should avoid that nudity altogether, but I think you should do it in a sort of tasteful way where it's not just, you know, way in your face. So I like the fact that they did that, actually, but, you you know, you kind of have to be 18 or older to watch this on YouTube because it's got, you know, it does have that issue. So if you, if you run into it and you have an account and you're under 18, it'll... I don't know this for sure, because my account, obviously, I am over 18, but I'm guessing if you try to watch it and you're under 18 on your YouTube account, it'll probably tell you you can't. Um, so, but anyway, I, you know, like I said, I actually like that they did that the way that they did it, because that's the way I think I would do it if I was going to make a movie about Turin Turumbar. It's a very adult story. There's no getting around that, and so there's no point in hiding away from all of that stuff. And... You know, the story basically proceeds from there, and we get, you know, pretty much the whole thing, and the suicide, and everything else. Uh, the costumes are fairly simple. Again, it's a low-budget production. That's not a huge surprise, but they're, you know, they're not bad. They're they're pretty decent. Um, Turin does constantly wear a helmet, which is not, you know, it's, it's not like you would imagine the dragon helm of Dor Loman, but it does set him apart, which is kind of nice. And he is constantly carrying the sword, for the most part. So, I mean, they do a good job of, like, tying everything together in such a way that if you know what story it is, you understand who's who and what's going on and all that stuff. So, I mean, they skip a huge amount of material, because they're trying to condense it all into a very short, <laughs> very short fan film. But it's an enjoyable watch, because the song... The way it's sung, I mean, you just got to listen to it. I will link to it in the description below, of course. But the song itself, the way it's sung, the tone, the melancholy, everything about it is a very fitting type of song to sing the story to because it's it's got that really sad element to it and it's a very sad story. It's, you know, I mean, the whole thing, it, it goes together really well. So, I mean, for a low-budget production, they did a great job. But like I said, the main thing that I wish they had done was add a little bit more musical accompaniment to the song. Nothing fancy. I mean, you don't want it to overwhelm the song itself. But just that piano with a kind of repetitive tune was, to me, just a little bit too little. And the fact that they skipped so much of Turin's early life and just skipped to the sack of Norgadron, it's just like, Whoa, where, where, what, what happened? So, you know, we don't even get any Beleg. We don't get any anything in Doriath at all, as far as I can tell. 
so it's, it is a little bit disorienting until you realize what's happened. And then you're like, okay, we just skipped half of Turin's life. And, uh, but, you know, other than that, I like it. It's, it's really impressive. It's, you know, for the, what they had to work with, they did a really good job. So I do recommend that you go watch it if you can. Uh, and, you know, you know, just figure out a way to watch it if, if that's, a, you know, something you're comfortable with. So that's Nienor Niniel. The other fan film is called The Legend of Gurthang, or Gurthang, as they say it in the film. And this one is very different because it's... The story itself is an excuse to kind of tell you about Turin's story, but it's not actually Turin's story. It's, it's fascinating because what happens is our main character is a guy from Arnor during the wars with Angmar. And what he's been tasked with by whoever the current king is, is retrieving Gurthong from Tol Morwen, which is the island that's left that has Morwen's and Turin's grave on, you know, this island that is one of the few places left after the sinking of Beleriand at the end of the First Age. And he's been tasked with recovering this sword, A, because nobody wants it to fall into the hands of the Witch King of Angmar, and B, because it's a really powerful weapon, and so it's kind of nice to have, right? So, the first part, and a good chunk of the film, is our main character kind of narrating Turin's life. Although he kind of condenses it in some other kind of strange ways, like he actually talks about Beleg getting killed by Turin and whatnot, and he's not narrating Turin's story so much as he's narrating the story of the sword. So he talks about the forging and Beleg's use of it, and then Turin getting it after he kills Beleg with it. And he, you know, he kind of short shrifts a lot of Turin's story because he's focusing mostly on the blade, not so much Turin's story per se. Uh, but he does some interesting things there, too. Like, he talks about how after Turin kills Beleg, he vows to use the sword only for good, which is not really what happens in the story. And he skips over the fact that Turin is, you know, kind of completely out of it, and Gwyndor has to lead him basically by the hand to, to Nargothrond and, you know, get him to safety. So he kind of skims over a lot of that stuff. But you know, again, it's mostly about the sword, so it's kind of forgivable that he skips over a lot of this. It's just that connection to Turin is the reason I'm covering it here along with the other one because they're both just heavily connected. So he gives us all this backstory about the sword and said that the sword was, you know, allegedly buried with Turin, which of course is what it says in the book if you read the Silmarillion or the Children of Hurin standalone story. And it actually shows like this big pedestal into which the sword was stuck. Now, here's one of those, one of the small things that I don't like particularly about this film. The sword that they use looks basically like a Roman gladius. Gladius? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Uh, <laughs> I should, but I don't. I think it's gladius. Uh, but anyway, it basically looks like a Roman gladius. It has almost no cross guard. It really has no cross guard. It has a handle very much like a Roman gladius. It's, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that per se, but, you know, when I think of an elven sword, I think of a standard kind of medieval European cross guard hilt sword because that's, you know, the kind of the thing that Tolkien was going for was a medieval slash you know, late medieval kind of thing. He was They were wearing chain mail. They were wear, using swords, straight swords. And it talks about, you know, going... When, when Turin stabs Glaurung, it says he stabs him up to the hilts. So, I mean, he's getting to the cross guard. That's what he's talking about there. Uh, so, the fact that they use a, what looks like a Roman gladius is just kind of like... It takes you out a little bit now, the guy probably didn't have access to, like, a ton of different swords, so, I mean, I don't know how much real choice he had in the matter. I don't know. Uh, I will say this. This one is a slightly higher production value, in a sense. The guy's cinematography is more complex. His, you know, the, it's 
got more music to it than just the simple piano melody that's in the Neonor Niniel. And so those things are nice. Uh, and the music actually is, is done really well because the music is done in such a way to kind of fit the what's going on in the story as it's happening. And it's not just the same thing with the song all the way through, which fits for the other one. But this one, it's nice that they vary it up a little bit because it's talking about different elements of the story, uh, the history of the sword and what he's doing on the island. So, you know, after he relates basically the history of the sword, it shows him on the island and he's looking for the sword and he finds the pedestal where the sword was shown to be stuck in, which presumably is Turin's grave, and the sword's not there. It's like, hmm, that's kind of weird. So he keeps on looking around and he eventually finds the sword and it's lying next to a skeleton. <laughs> Which is like, okay, that's interesting. So he takes it and he starts walking, presumably back to whatever ship, you know, brought him to the island. And as he's walking along, he starts having these images of the story that he's already told and, and the things that the sword has done in its life, <laughs> I guess. Um, and it's... You know, all the bad things that it's done, like killing Baleg and taking Turin's life when he commits suicide and all this stuff. And, you know, he stops and he just kind of looks at it and he says, I'm, I'm, you will not go to my king. You will not drink his blood. I'm going to throw you into the sea. And so he starts walking again. And then this deep, cold voice, you know, starts talking and says, what's, what, what's one more? And he stops and he's like, what? <laughs> so it's playing up on the fact, of course, that in the Turin story, whenever Turin is about to commit suicide, he asks the sword, you know, will you take my take take my blood or drink my blood? I can't remember exactly how he asks it, and the sword apparently answers and says, "Yeah, I will take your blood in, you know, kind of recompense for killing Baleg." Uh, so the sword talks in this story too, and he. He stops and he looks at it and then he starts walking again and the next thing you know his foot hits a rock and he slips, trips backward, the sword goes way up in the air, he falls on his back and the sword comes down and nails him in the chest. And of course now we know why the sword was lying next to a skeleton earlier <laughs> and that's why, why he didn't find it in the grave because apparently somebody tried this already. Um, so it, this is one of the interesting things about this particular film is it gives the sword a whole lot of agency. It gives it more agency even than the one ring in one sense, because like the, the one ring can't, I don't think there's anything that suggests that the one ring can really go that far in making physical things happen in the real world. Whereas here, it's like the implication is Gurthong is the thing that made him trip and fall and the sword comes down and kills him. Which, in Turin's story, which is really all we have for the, you know, story of Gurthong or Anglachel, there's nothing to suggest that the sword has that kind of agency. There's hints, of course, that the sword does have kind of a... I'm not sure how exactly I would word this. Uh, like, there's something about the sword. It's like, the way it words it in the story is something to the effect that, you know, if it if it bites something, it's going to kill it. So, like, if it nicks you at any point, it's going to kill you. And, of course, that comes true for basically everything because Beleg nicks Turin, and that's what wakes him up and leads Turin to kill Beleg, thinking that he's an orc. And he doesn't die there, of course, but he does die later by the same sword when he commits suicide. So it's like everything that that blade cuts, it will eventually kill. But it's not like the sword is the thing doing it. It's like there's just a... what I really don't know what the word I want to use here is. It's just like there's a fate tied to the sword that it just... That's just the way it works. Like... And Melian, of course, does say to Beleg, you know, like, this, the evil spirit of its creator is still kind of in there. The malice, or I forget exactly what word she uses. But the idea is that the sword is kind of not 
not nice. <laughs> but that still doesn't tell us that it has this level of agency. So I think they went a little far there, although I, I kind of can't blame them, because if you're going to make a story about the sword itself and what happens to it after Turin's life is over, did, I mean, to, to make that interesting, you kind of have to go that route. So I know I'm not complaining too much there. I just think that it's a little bit over much that it would lead the guy to trip on a rock, fall down and throw the sword in the air and get himself stabbed in the chest. So um, it's just it's just a little much. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it gives the story of, like I said, it's not exactly the story of Turin, although there's a huge amount of overlap, but it's the story of the sword itself. It kind of goes from its forging to Beleg to Turin, and then its burial, and then who knows what this other guy did that became a skeleton before our main character shows up, who he was, why he was trying to get the sword, who knows. Um, but it, the whole thing just ends up being really interesting. And of course, it's completely you know, made up. There's no indication that anybody from Arnor ever went and tried to get the sword or whatever, but it's not outside the realm of possibility that something like that did happen. So it's one of those kind of interesting what-if things that you can do with Tolkien because Tolkien does tell us the sword was buried with Turin and we do know that his gravesite survived the sinking of Beleriand and is on Tol Morwen. So if somebody wanted to, they could theoretically, in fact, go try to dig up that sword and use it. You wouldn't be very smart to try, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's not impossible. And so it's it's something that, you know, it's not gonna, it's not an outright contradiction of anything in Tolkien's written works. So, you know, I can't fault him for that. It's not, you know, it, there's nothing that says nobody did do that. No, I don't think anybody did. I don't think Tolkien had any notion that anybody did. Uh, but it's a cool what if. And so that's kind of the interesting thing about this particular fan film is it's it's not a retelling of something. It's kind of tr taking that other minds and hands idea and saying, what if we fill in just kind of a blank spot in Tolkien's stuff and throw this little thing in there? You know, what would that be like? You know, kind of cool. So... That's kind of my overall impressions of this film. Like I said, links to both films will be in the description below so you can check them out for yourself. Uh, both are perfectly you know, interesting and, and worthwhile endeavors uh, in their own right. They're just very different. I just put them together in this video because they're both so connected to Turin because, I mean, one of them is about the sword that Turin carried for most of his adult life. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I should say that. Yeah, I guess probably so. Um, and the other is about the Turin story, kind of through the the point of view of Neonor, because the the movie is titled Neonor Niniel. Um, but you know, it's just the the connection to Turin made them kind of a nice double feature, if you will, to discuss in one video because they're both very short. They don't have a whole lot of complexity because they're both taking something grand and sweeping and condensing it down really small, like 10 minute videos each roughly. So, you know, that's, it's not like you're going to lose a lot of time watching these either. So, you know, even if you're not super impressed by either of them, by the end of it, you've lost 20 minutes. You know, what's, what's the worst that could happen. And this is the other interesting thing that I find about it is the fan films that are made about Tolkien's work, even when they veer into the realm of invention, like this Le Legend of Gurthang video, but but also when they actually try to just kind of faithfully tell stories that Tolkien has already done, they tend to be really good in terms of, you know, given the level of production quality they can afford, they tend to be really good. I mean, like, I've done reviews of other fan films before, and it's like, the one consistent thing is they tend to be pretty impressive in terms of how they do things and, and the, you know, the really major fans tend to be really good about capturing at least kind of the heart of what Tolkien is doing, even if they do veer off in some interesting <laughs> directions sometimes. So, and these are both examples of that. The Neonor Ninial one, I forget exactly, 
It might say in the description of that video where it was done. I want to say it was somewhere in Eastern Europe, and I think that's why they're, the the singing is in a. It is in English, but it's it's just got an accent, and I don't know what the accent is because it's been a while since I actually watched it. But it does tell, I think, somewhere where it was done, and that tells you kind of why the singing is not exactly you know, normal like American or British English. It's It's got an accent to it, a really strong accent too. Um, but anyway, that's those two videos. Hope you check them out. Hope you enjoy them. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please do give it a like, thumbs up. Check out all my social links below. Follow me on Twitter for Tolkien-related trivia questions every week. And until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namarie. Thanks to all the channel supporters, especially Elf Friends, PA Brew News, Nathan DeFore, Paul Leone, and Oleg Gregg.